Hi students, welcome to Year 11 Biology and Cells as the Basis of Life. This is video number 15 and this time we're going to delve just a little bit into some of the very important biochemistry that's associated with eukaryotes and also just a little bit of a, a touch on um, some of the prokaryotic biochem as well. This is a very, very complex area and this is going to oversimplify it, I know, but I think it'll at least give us a little bit of background and then you can build on that if you want to have a little bit of a look at some of these processes in a little bit more detail at the end of the video. So what we need to do is we need to investigate the biochemical processes of photosynthesis, cell respiration and the removal of cellular products and wastes in eukaryotic cells. So we're going to focus here on photosynthesis and cell respiration. Uh, a separate video is dealt with the removal of cellular products and wastes uh, and that uh, primarily is carried out by lysosomes. But in this particular video, we're going to be looking at the function of the chloroplasts and the mitochondria as they are critical to the processes of photosynthesis and respiration, respectively. Photosynthesis and respiration are two complementary processes. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is that the products of one are the reactants of the other. The they're both very complex processes and in fact they're both complex processes that have been oversimplified in a lot of ways but it allows us to study these processes and to get a bit of an understanding about what's going on uh, in both photosynthesis and respiration and to try and uh, understand that there are several layers of complexity below that surface um, that we don't really need to get into a lot at this early stage of your biology careers. What we're going to do is to try and peel away some of that simplicity, look at a little bit more of the complexity associated with both of these processes and to see if we can understand a little bit more about why they occur in, in plants and or animals and what the benefits uh, are of these two processes. Um, so let's have a look at each one in a little bit of detail. So firstly, photosynthesis. Photosynthesis is carried out in two distinct phases. Now there are, again, more steps involved here than we're going to deal with, but we're going to at least try and see if we can look at the two key phases of photosynthesis and what's actually going on in each one. The equation here, which uh, I've borrowed from Blitzing Biology, has uh, a really interesting way of representing uh, the equation for photosynthesis. Usually we cancel these six water molecules uh, and just put six waters on the reactant side of this particular equation and the reason that we do that is because in any equation like we do in mathematics if you have like terms on both sides you cancel them out. But this is a more accurate way of writing it because what it shows is a relationship between the water molecules and the oxygen molecules. And the first stage of photosynthesis is what we call photolysis or l the light dependent phase. This is uh, literally breaking down using light. So photo means light and lies means to cut or slice. And so this is a process that occurs in the light that allows uh, water molecules to actually be broken down into hydrogen and oxygen gas. This occurs in the grana of the um, of the chloroplasts and specifically in the little stacks of thylakoid membranes that contain chlorophyll. It's the chlorophyll that absorbs that energy that takes in the, the light energy and it uses that energy to split the water molecules into hydrogen ions and oxygen molecules. So that means that when we look at all of the water that's being split into hydrogen and oxygen if we look at how much we're producing, then we actually need 12 of these to produce six uh, oxygen molecules. That is the source of the oxygen that's released in photosynthesis, and it comes directly from this photolyzing of the water molecules. And that's why this is a slightly more accurate way of representing it, even though we haven't um, uh, removed the like terms or cancelled out the like terms because it shows us that those water molecules when they're broken down in this first phase um, are the ones that produce oxygen. Now the diagram below is a more complex one and I think what's important here is to notice that there are a couple of important energy transport molecules. We've already talked about one of them before ATP 
ATP is an energy carrier in the cell and it's actually produced in this first stage of photosynthesis and that energy is going to be very important for the second phase. But there's another important um, little carrier molecule of energy and electrons here called NADP. And this little system is also something that allows the facilitation of electrons to be moved into the second phase of photosynthesis and that's the uh, and that's the next phase which we'll have a look at in the next slide. So the second phase is a light independent phase it doesn't need light it can occur uh, during the daytime but it doesn't need light to for this particular phase to uh, be undertaken and this occurs in the stroma. This is the stage where the hydrogen that's come from the water molecule, so the breakdown of the water molecules released oxygen and the hydrogen is being transported through into the stroma. And it's being carried there along with electrons um, and uh, lots of energy and that allows for the transfer of or, or the fixing, uh, if you prefer, of the hydrogen to the carbon dioxide. Um, that process of linking hydrogen and carbon dioxide is what leads us to the formation of the carbohydrate glucose, C6H12O6. Again, we, we are oversimplifying things, but we have to because it's such a complex system. This process is known as the Calvin cycle, and if you really want to um, be scratching your head for a little bit, go and have a look at the Calvin cycle. It's a great biochemical pathway, um, but it is uh, more complex than you need to look at for your uh, Year 11 biology course. The important thing, I guess, is to understand that the way that the chloroplasts are structured is that there are distinct regions. The, the granite and the stroma are the two that we kind of focus on as the two distinct regions that we notice when we look at the um, chloroplasts. And we notice that the granite themselves are made up of these uh, individual little stacks of thylakoids. And this is where the concentration of the chloroplasts is. It's where the first stage or the first phase occurs. And then we have that transfer of hydrogen and energy and electrons into the stroma for this second phase. Of course, once glucose has been produced, glucose can be used uh, to build complex carbohydrates. But it can also be used for proteins and for lipid construction. So a lot of the bulk uh, biomass of the plant is built from this fundamental glucose building block. And of course, glucose is also important in the process of respiration. So this is a critical molecule. It's certainly not a waste product. It's a critical product of the process of photosynthesis that is used by living things, especially plants, and then also um, animals as we are unable to um, go through the process of photosynthesis. And so therefore, the glucose that's required by all heterotrophs must be consumed. The second process is respiration. Respiration, as we said before, is the complement of photosynthesis only in as far as the reactants of photosynthesis are the products of respiration and vice versa. But what we actually now recognize is that respiration is a very general term and there's a couple of different types of respiration anaerobic, which is in the absence of oxygen, or aerobic. There are two main types of anaerobic respiration. Uh, alcohol fermentation, which is carried out by yeasts and is used in the um, alcohol industry. And when the glucose is broken down in the absence of oxygen, we get carbon dioxide being produced, but we also get ethanol. The other form of anaerobic respiration is one that actually occurs uh, for us if we uh, have, say, exercised for long periods of time, we've depleted the oxygen levels in our muscles, we can go into lactic acid fermentation. What happens then is that instead of producing carbon dioxide and water, the glucose just pr produces uh, a couple of lactic acid molecules and also produces two ATP. And one of the things that's important about anaerobic respiration is we have a much lower ATP production than we do with aerobic respiration. And of course, aerobic respiration involves uh, excess ox oxygen, so the glucose can be broken down and if you've looked at things like the difference between complete and incomplete combustion, you know if you've got more oxygen, things burn more efficiently and you get more energy. 
The same is true here. This process releases a lot more energy in the form of ATP when, when there is a lot of oxygen present than when the oxygen is absent. Depending on who you read and where the research is up to, you may find that there are some um, differences in the reporting of exactly how many ATP molecules are produced per glucose molecule in aerobic respiration. The numbers used to be between 36 and 38. Uh, now it seems that as we learn more about these processes and the other um, energy carrier molecules that are involved, that maybe that number is more like 30 to 32. But um, we'll give you that uh, sort of little range there, just, just so you understand the comparison between the amount of ATP available from aerobic respiration compared to uh, anaerobic. And either way, it's still much, much bigger. Uh, I don't want to get into too much of what's happening. You'll notice that uh, one of the important things, we've always talked about structure and function. If you look at the structure of the mitochondria, you see, again, it's structured to increase the size uh, uh, increase the amount of surface area for these reactions to occur. And we see this a lot when we look at different structures. We saw it with the chloroplasts, and we're seeing it here with the mitochondria, large surface area for greater efficiency, greater exchange, higher reaction rates. The um, glucose itself doesn't actually enter the mitochondria um, for the process of respiration. What happens is glycolysis happens first, and that happens in the cytosol, so that's that's part of the cytoplasm, where one glucose molecule will be broken down into two pyruvate molecules. These are three carbon molecules, the pyruvates, and they will be transported into the mitochondria, where the first thing that will happen to them is they'll be converted, they'll release a carbon dioxide, and be converted into a two carbon complex with the acetyl coenzyme A. We're now starting to get again into the very complexity of the biochemistry associated with respiration. And again, you can have a look at this process in more detail. It's called the citric acid cycle or TCA cycle. Uh, or the Krebs cycle, and they'll give you a, a, a mind-blowing experience of um, molecular biochemistry and the biochemical pathways associated with respiration. Again, you don't need to go into that sort of detail. I think it's important, probably um, a few terms here you may not even need. But just to give you a little bit of an idea of the fact that these are very complex processes, but they're both critical processes for all living things. And they're the way in which we get that very, very important energy molecule, ATP, um, which fuels so many of the chemical reactions in our bodies. Thanks for watching.